Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for the opportunity to come and worship you. We thank you for the pregnancy center. We thank you for pregnancy centers everywhere. And Father, we, we come before you ashamed of a government that advocates the killing of unborn babies. We come before you ashamed of a nation that has stooped so low. And Father, whereas we ask mercy upon those that advocate such policies, I also ask that you will bring your judgment upon them. That you will break them and cause them to see the sin that is being poured out, allowed to happen, legislated so it can happen, supported, and, and really, Father, just advocated in our country. And, and Father, we know that so many other countries in the world follow our country's lead. As one who's been all over the world, I, I see the policies of governments that try to match what ours does. And Father, we would ask that you would intervene and that you would bring to end this whole-scale destruction of human life. Not only with the unborn, but also, Father, we know where our country is going. It's not hard to see. Abortion will become euthanasia. And we'll see other great travesties coming. And Father... We pray that you would cause the church to be strong and take a stand. Father, we have a tendency to look the other way. Not take risks. Not boldly confront our culture, our government, our leaders. Father, I pray that you would cause us to see what has happened because the church perhaps has not confronted our culture. You tell us in Philippians 2 that we are the navigation lights, the stars upon which culture guides. And so, Father, we have to take some responsibility when we see a culture that has gone awry. Perhaps it is true that the church has become more like the world than the world has become like the church. Let us be the first to confess our sin and to acknowledge our wrongdoing and being too comfortable and in love with our conveniences and our comfort and our safety and security to take a stand where the battle is being fought. And so we thank you for pregnancy centers and people who are willing to volunteer their time and work in these ministries. We thank you that the work they're doing is noticed by you and is having positive effects. And we pray for more. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's be seated. The rescue. In the early evening of February 27th, 1979, I remember it very, very well. I was in my second year in the Coast Guard. I pulled watch at Coast Guard Station Kodiak, Alaska. Was anticipating a quiet night. I was a bosun's mate. Thought maybe I'd get a little reading in that night. When all of a sudden, in the radio room, the normally quiet radio on a February evening started crackling. And I heard the dreaded sound of Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. But what was more surprising and scary than that was what followed in the radio transmission. Mayday, mayday, mayday. This is Coast Guard Cutter Citrus. I'm sorry. This is Coast Guard Cutter Citrus requesting immediate assistance. We have struck a submerged object which has ruptured the whole port side of the hull and we are taking on water and sinking with a crew of 40. 
crew of 40 that I knew. Once over the shock, the citrus, which was returning to Kodiak from after having rescued a fishing boat, was now herself in need of rescue. We began dispatching aircraft, helicopters, C-130s, other Coast Guard cutters in the area, fishing boats that were close by, which were able to get to the Coast Guard cutter Citrus. And there were fatalities that day, that night. And what staggered me that night, at 19 years of age, and being on watch, and being the one that's got to start figuring this out before the officer of the deck gets there to take over, was that the rescuer had become the one in need of rescue. And in our passage for today, which is Genesis 14, we have the story of another great rescue in which Abraham, the guy that we've been studying about in Genesis the last couple of weeks, pulls out all the stops in rushing to rescue those in need of deliverance from certain death only to meet at the end of the story, at the end of the day, the one who would spare no expense to rescue him and us as well. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 14 in your Bibles. Genesis chapter 14. And let me give you just a little bit of background information which will help us understand the story that God gives us in Genesis 14. Genesis 14 is essentially the record of the first major war on earth after the flood. And it's a war between a four-city state confederacy located in Babylon and a five-city state confederacy that is located in the Jordan River Valley east of where Jerusalem is. Interestingly enough, the first major earthly con conflict that we'll see here in Genesis 14 between the kings of Babylon and Abraham, who is the father of the nation of Israel, is a micro picture of the very last battle the Bible tells us will occur on earth when all the kings of the earth form an alliance and will gather at a place called Armageddon in Israel. That's all found in Revelation chapter 16, verse 16, through the end of Revelation 18. And what's really important to understand is that all the nations of the earth are said to be under the control and under the authority and under the power and influence of Babylon, the great city that rules over the kings and the rulers of the world. Now, now Babylon is always considered in the Bible to be a picture of human civilization without God. So Babylon then is not so much a geographical place, but rather is a term that is used to identify humanity's rebellion against God and the desire to do away with God altogether. So when the Bible is using the term Babylon in the New Testament, it's not referring to the ancient city of Babylon, but rather to what the ancient city of Babel from which we get Babylon, stood for. A city that wanted to make a name for itself without God. Had no place for God. And so when the New Testament uses this term Babylon, it, it's, it's referring to the idea and the spirit which Babylon represents, which is hatred of God, rebellion against God, and the total obliteration of God from the minds of people. Now, it used to be that people would look at that and they would say, I don't see how that could ever happen. Do you really have to look that hard anymore? And so this is why the book of Revelation identifies all the nations and all the kingdoms of the world, including the good old USA, as being under the influence, under the power, and under the authority of Babylon. And why in the final battle on earth, all the nations which are simply referred to as Babylon, gather at a place called Armageddon in Israel to wipe out Israel, 
to wipe Israel off the face of the earth because in their minds, Israel represents the last vestiges of the concept of God. But then in Revelation 19, verses 11 through 21, as the nations of the world under the banner of the spirit of Babylon are gathered at Armageddon to destroy Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ returns, followed by the heavenly army and all the armies of the earth known as Babylon turn their weaponry upon Christ and are completely, immediately destroyed by him. Remember, at the second coming, Jesus comes to damn. He comes to destroy and he comes to damn. The first time he came, he came to save. When he comes again, it's not to save. It is to destroy and to damn. And he wipes them all out. And then he establishes his kingdom upon the earth. And so Genesis 14 is picturing in a micro way this last battle. You see, the Bible is one story, and we've been talking about that over and over again, that Genesis fits with Revelation, and all the books in between are just adding the details. And so God introduces right here in the first 14 chapters the very last battle. He's going to give us some information on that that will be helpful in understanding really the whole realm of human history. So Genesis 14 is picturing this, this, this last battle, this rescue of God's people from a world system known as Babylon, which hates God and reveals this hatred for God by devaluing and trashing those who represent God. And, and you see this whole idea that you can't devalue or trash God without also devaluing and trashing God's image bearers in passages like Psalm 53. Read Psalm 53 sometime. Read Psalm 14. They're identical. We don't have time today to read those, but what I want you to see is that those Psalms both start with people, describing people who say there is no God. And then it tells us what happens when those kind of people are in charge. They begin to treat human life as a loaf of bread. Now why is that significant? Because loaves of bread are disposable. Bread was this common commodity in Israel. It's a common commodity everywhere, right? Unless you're in a famine. You can't afford to eat. But for the most part, bread is pretty common. It's pretty available. It's readily accessible. And if you, if you had to throw something out that was of value, you probably wouldn't be too concerned with throwing out a loaf of bread, would you? And so what God says is when people begin to trash the Creator, they will have no choice but to end up trashing the creation. You can't trash the Creator. You can't trash the sovereign God of the universe and not trash the creation and those who represent the sovereign God of the universe, the Creator. You can't trash Him without trashing image bearers, people. And you end up treating people as though they are disposable. Well, that helps us understand what Babylon wanted to do. So Psalm 53, which would be good to look at sometime, is telling us that those people and those societies and those governments that have devalued God will reveal this devaluation of God primarily in their treatment of human life and primarily of human beings who cannot defend themselves, such as the poor, the widows, the orphans, the aged, and yes, the unborn. We, we don't realize the Bible is so relevant, do we? We sometimes don't recognize that, that this book that God has given us, that has provides us with all that we need to know for faith and practice, also talks about the devaluation of life that we see in abortion, in euthanasia, 
in how those people who are different are treated. Now what all these classes of people have in common is that they have no resources by which to provide for their own care and their own defense. In other words, they are dependent upon others to survive. And so when humanity chooses to devalue and trash God, it will end up devaluing and trashing defenseless human beings because they see them as disposable, as I said, like a loaf of bread. And so with all this background, let's, let's jump into the story in Genesis 14. And what we're going to see is Abraham's response to the devaluation of human life by those who have devalued God. So after Abraham and Lot and their flocks and their people separate in Genesis 13, okay? Remember, Abraham had gone down into Egypt to avoid the famine, and he does the unthinkable and the despicable, and he tries to pass off his wife as his sister so that Pharaoh won't take his wife and kill him. Pretty low spot in Abraham's life and in his marriage, right? He repents. And step by step, it says in the first four verses of Genesis 13, he makes his way back to where he needs to be, back in the promised land. He goes back to where he starts, and he has a talk with God, okay? Now, it's a step-by-step -step process of repentance that we see in Abraham's life. And that helps us understand that when you and I screw up, and God brings us to the point of repenting, that sometimes that repentance takes a long time. You know, often we don't get to throw a Hail Mary in our repentance, okay? And we think, oh, I'll just take care of this at one Hail Mary. We're done. We're good, right, God? God says, not so fast. Because in your sin, you left a wake of destruction. And guess what? You're going to have to stop at every one of those points and start making things right. And eventually, you'll get back to where you started. Okay, so that's where Abraham's at right now. He has gone step by step backward to the place where he was before he chose to divert off course. He's gone into the mountains because the land cannot contain both Lot and Abraham and all they have. It's just, it's just not big enough to contain these two men and all their possessions, all their people, all their flocks. So Abraham tells his nephew Lot, Listen, you look over the land, and you pick where you want to go, and I'll go in the other direction. So Lot says, I'll take those nice little cities down there in the Jordan River Valley. Sodom and Gomorrah, those kind of cities. You know, very wholesome, family-oriented kind of places. <laughs> Lot knows what's going on in those cities. He knows that they're perverse. He knows that they're practicing homosexuality. He knows that God hates that. He knows that that's sin. But see, Lot has this problem of thinking, I'll just get as close to the edge as I possibly can without going over. So he goes down there to live in these cities, and before long, he becomes an elder in one of these cities, a leader in one of these cities. In other words, he got a little too close to the mud hole, and he stepped in it. But that's where he's at. So he's living down there. Abraham is living up in the high country. And then Babylon attacks. Now Babylon's strategy was to conquer this whole region so as to restore its power over those people groups which had emerged as a result of the scattering that took place at the Tower of Babel. Remember all the people who were at the Tower of Babel? God confused their language. Everybody separates. Well, there's many people that stayed right there, and they established this four-city state kingdom, and they wanted to bring everybody back. They wanted to restore their power. And so they began a campaign of moving from Mesopotamia throughout the region reconquering people. Ancient extra-biblical records from this time period, which would have been about 2500 to 2100 BC, reveal that, that this military campaign of Babylon was a major invasion that resulted in the destruction of multiple city-states along the route from Babylon to Canaan. And that's where Lot's at in those five 
cities down in the Jordan River Valley, and that's where Abraham is up in the mountains. So, so they're making their way to Canaan, the promised land, and they are just taking kingdom after kingdom and placing it under their authority. They're conquering them. And they finally get to the Jordan River Valley. And the five city-states in that Jordan River Valley decide to fight back. And so there's a major battle. And it ends up killing hundreds of thousands of people. The discovery was made in 1924 in the area of this Jordan River Valley, and it revealed the ruins of one of these five cities, the largest of the cities, the northernmost city. What the archaeological evidence revealed is that the city was destroyed militarily and then it was burned to the ground and next to the city was found a giant mass grave containing over 500,000 human remains. This was a major invasion that killed hundreds of thousands of people. Then between 1924 and 1979, the rest of the cities were discovered. They were dug up and all revealed the same evidence of major military conflict. Yet in spite of the havoc and the destruction and the death that this mighty army out of Babylon reaped on these five city-states of the Jordan River Valley, Something happened four to five days later after the final battle. It, it met with disaster about 200 miles north of Jerusalem, near Damascus on its way home, when it was routed and destroyed by an unknown force. So, so this battle that we're looking at in Genesis 14, 1 through 12 was not just a minor petty skirmish. It was a major invasion which entailed ethnic cleansing and genocide. So that's what happens in Genesis 14, 1 through 12. Let's look at Abraham's response in Genesis 14, 13 through 16. Follows, I read, a man who had escaped, escaped the battle, came and reported all this to Abram the Hebrew. Abram is Abraham. Now Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre, the Amorite, a brother of Eschol and Anar, all of whom were allied with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, because Lot and his family were taken captive by the Babylonian army as hostages, okay? They came through, they didn't kill them right away, they take them as hostages. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. That's up near the Sea of Galilee, north of Capernaum. During the night, Abram divided his men to attack them and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. Now you know the identity of the unknown force that wiped out this huge army. But how does it happen? He recovered all the goods and he brought back his relative Lot and his possessions together with the women and the other peoples. Let's stop there just for a moment. So verse 13 tells us that Abraham, the Hebrew, and Hebrew means one from beyond. That, that's literally what it means. So Abram, the Hebrew, one from beyond. Here's what has happened to this region. And he hears that Lot, his nephew, and Lot's family and possessions were taken as hostage. And so then he responds. And the first thing we see him doing is he mobilizes his own defensive fighting force, 318 men who were all born in his household, which means that he knows every one of them and has a relationship with every one of them. And he gives them the order to deploy, pursue, and engage this huge Babylonian army who had killed so many people and taken his family hostage. I mean, Abraham is going to take all kinds of risks here, but not only risking his own life, he's going to risk the lives of people he loves and knows in order to save the defenseless. And we don't even see that Abram really thinks about this too much. It's as though this is an immediate response. The defenseless are being attacked. The defenseless have been taken hostage. The defenseless will be killed. We have to do something. 
It wasn't. Well, let's get the elders together. Let's form a committee. <laughs> and well, let's see committees. We've got so many meetings in this place that, well, they're going to have to meet on a Thursday on an off week from Saturday night. We'll hold it, hold it. No, we've got another committee this time about church finances that week. So no, we've got to do this over here. And then, then we'll, get, we'll get a recommendation from the committee. We'll then present it to the elders. Let's go to the deacons. Then we'll go to the elders. And, and then we'll talk about it. And then we, we'll do something. Abraham gets the news. The defenseless are in trouble. I have the resources to meet that need. Well, that's something to think about, isn't it? Why does God give us resources? You know, I was in a church once. My second church. You already know I'm a little brash. And I don't stay within protocol. Never have. And this church... This was back in the days when thirty, forty thousand dollars was a lot of money. And they had it in their bank account. We had a school. And they wouldn't give the staff of the school a raise. And these guys were living on, on pennies. And, and they, they wouldn't break into those accounts to give a raise. And so I, I just said to the, the deacons, who were really the leaders of the church, I said, you know what? Lose it, use it or lose it. God doesn't give money to the church as a storehouse. We're not a storehouse. We are a clearinghouse. We're to use it for the glory of God in ministry. And I think it's going to be a sad day when we stand before the Lord and have to give an account, not for the money that was spent, but for the money that was not spent. And explain to Him, why is your bank account so big? So I told them, use it or lose it. I lost my job. <laughs> I ended up becoming a teacher at a Christian school. <laughs> that church burned down within six months. And they lost everything. Use it or lose it. Abraham uses it. 318 men, you were trained. These are trained men. They were trained for a purpose. And so he says, well, why were they trained? Well, they were trained to be used, right? Well, then let's use them. Go. And so he deploys them to go. And understand, they're going against an army that has just left a city, five cities in total destruction with a mass grave with 500,000 dead people in it. This is a huge army. I mean, what can Abraham do against, what can 318 people do against this? Well, ask Gideon. God said, I'm not even going to let you fight until I whittle your army down to 300. So he mobilizes his own defensive fighting force of 318 men, gives them the order to deploy, pursue, engage. And then once they catch up with the Babylonian army near Dan, which is 108 miles north of the original battle site. So his 318 men got on their horses and they made this ride 108 miles north. They caught up with the Babylonian army at night. Abraham divided the small army at night. They attacked the huge army of Babylon, which is totally surprised. No one has ever fought back before. With the result being that the Babylonian army was completely routed and chased down for the next 90 some miles until it was destroyed near Damascus and Abraham rescued Lot. Boy, that, you know, don't mess with my family, right? <laughs> he rescues Lot, Lot's family, in verses 15 through 16, he brings them home. What a story! But, but what's it got to do with recognition of sanctity of human life this Sunday? Well, really everything. And I, I, I'm going to warn you, I'm going over today. So <laughs> if you need to hit the buffet line, go ahead. <laughs> everything. What's it got to do with it? Everything. Because once Abraham hears that the lives of innocent people are in danger, he does something about it. Now, he didn't have to do anything. He really didn't have to do anything. And, and the fact is, he could have easily rationalized his way into simply staying at home and hoping that everything would work out for the best 
and done absolutely nothing about trying to rescue these people. I mean, Abraham could have simply rationalized that life is tough, these kinds of things happen all the time in an unjust, sinful, and corrupt world. So the best thing to do is just maintain the status quo, stay out of the way, and adopt a tolerant live and let live and look the other way attitude when it comes to evil. That's the church much of the time. Because that's Christians much of the time. The second way Abraham could have justified not getting involved in the fight to rescue the innocent was to say, well, you know, God is sovereign and nothing in this world happens apart from his sovereignty and knowledge. And therefore, if God wanted to stop this kind of thing, he'd do it himself. And if he doesn't stop it, well, then he's simply allowing it. What can we do? You hear that too, don't you? That is a wrong perspective on the sovereignty of God. Now you've moved into fatalism. And that's, that's not a biblical understanding of God's sovereignty. Another argument Abraham could have used to justify passivism would have been to adopt the line of thinking that says, why make trouble for myself and my family? Why, why bring attention to us? I mean, right now, no one even knows I exist up here in these mountains. But if I get involved in this and I try to do something to help, I'm going to bring undue attention to myself and to my family, and I could end up paying a price for it. It's too risky. And, and why make enemies when I don't have any skin in the game? Finally, Abraham could have just said, you know, if Lot hadn't moved down there to live with those perverted people in Sodom and Gomorrah in the first place, he never would have gotten into this trouble. Let him get himself out. Now, all of these reasons for not getting involved sound kind of familiar, don't they? I mean, some even sound pious and spiritual. They even make sense, really. I mean, I mean in our culture, this makes sense, perfect sense. But they're all wrong. They're all wrong. And Abraham just isn't thinking like this. And really what we're seeing is Abraham becoming the man of faith God wants him to be. One who is willing to face danger, engage risk, pursue a strategy of trusting God with all the unknowns, and put others, even the undeserving, first and before himself and his own safety, his own security, his own prosperity, comfort, and convenience, even if it costs him everything. Remember those 318... Trained fighting men are the fighting men that defend him and his family. If he loses them, he loses his security. And so he risks his security to rescue the defenseless. Ooh. Wow. One author put it, the person of faith is a realist, not a passive coward, or one incapable of leadership. When the crisis comes, he draws new strength from God and he pursues to victory. But, but you know what? As great a person of faith Abraham is revealing himself to be in this passage, he's not the real hero of the story. It seems like he's the hero, but he's not the hero. You see, there's an unseen actor in this story and he's the real story, the real hero that the story's pointing to. Look at verses 17 through 20. It's just 14. Now look at verse 17. And Abram returned, returned from defeating Kedor Laamar, and the kings allied with him. The king of Sodom came to meet him in the valley of Shiva, that is the king's valley. Then, look at verse 18. Then, here's this mysterious character. Then, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And praised be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. So, so after Abram returns to the Jordan River Valley and returns all the hostages, all the possessions, all the livestock that he's rescued, he's met by this mysterious king named Melchizedek, who's the king of Salem, and who's also a priest of God Most High. And not only that, he's also a prophet, because he speaks for God in verses 19 through 20, when he says, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. So this Melchizedek is a prophet, a priest, and a king. 
Now, this is really important because the only other person in Scripture who is referred to as holding the offices of prophet, priest, and king is who? The Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Son of God. And so according to Hebrews 1, 1 through 2, Jesus is God's final word to us. Therefore, he is our prophet. According to Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, Jesus is our great high priest who has made the way for us to approach God's throne of grace with confidence. And according to Revelation 17, 14 and Revelation 19, 16, Jesus is called the King of Kings. So he is a prophet, a priest, and a king. Now, it's also significant that this Melchizedek is identified as the King of Salem or Shalom which means king of peace. So in Abraham's day, there was no city or earthly kingdom called Salem. Later, the name was applied to Jerusalem, which means city of peace. Jerusalem, peace, city of peace. It was applied to Jerusalem in Psalm 76 too, but Salem probably would not have been a place Abraham would have recognized. So who is this king of this place that I don't even recognize? Literally, Melchizedek is the king of peace that Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 talks about when it says this. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the greatness of his kingdom and peace, there will be no end. But what makes this even more interesting is that the name Melchizedek itself means king of righteousness. So you have the king of peace, the king of righteousness, all in one person. And so this Melchizedek should start to become familiar to us a little bit. And if you're still wondering, you're not sure who he is, look over at Hebrews 7. Look at Hebrews 7, because this will tell us. Look at Hebrews chapter 7. Verses 1 through 4. Hebrews 7, 1 through 4. The New Testament tells us right here. It says this. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and he blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem means king of peace. See, you thought I was so smart. Where do you think I get this stuff? <laughs> but look at verse 3. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling, don't the word resembling or picturing throw you. It's talking about as a type. He's a a picture, a pre-incarnate picture of the Son of God. So what we really have happening here is that Melchizedek is a pre-incarnate picture of Christ. This simply means that before God the Son became a human being and came to earth and became Jesus, he appeared to Abraham in human form as Melchizedek, the king of righteousness and the king of peace. And then note that when Melchizedek meets Abraham, what does he bring? He brings bread and wine. Now listen, if you've got 318 guys that have just fought, fought the biggest army in the world at that time and have just come back with all these flocks and people and hostages, they're going to be a little hungry. You don't give them a little bread and a little wine. So this is not a meal. This is signifying something. What is it signifying? What's it a picture of? Bread and the wine. It's the elements of communion, which are a picture of the body and blood of our Savior Jesus Christ on the cross, where he goes to the cross as the king of righteousness. Because he is the only one righteous enough to pay for our sins and absorb the wrath of God we deserve so that he, as the king of peace, can reconcile us to God and give us peace with God the Father forever. So in Christ, righteousness and peace meet. And so we're having this picture of the gospel right here. So why has God given us a picture of the gospel? Here's where we'll close. Why does God give us a picture of the gospel? 
after this great rescue that Abraham performs because Abraham's rescue of Lot is a picture of Christ's rescue of us. Abraham's rescue of Lot, who didn't deserve to be rescued, was a picture of what Jesus did for us when he went to the cross on our behalf to pay our sin penalty, to rescue us from hell, and reconcile us to God. And so the rescuer, Abraham, still needed to be rescued by the ultimate rescue, Christ, when he gives up everything to die for people who didn't deserve him and really didn't want him. Finally, in Genesis 14, 19 to 20, Melchizedek tells Abraham who he is. He says, Blessed be Abraham by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand, who is the creator of heaven and earth. Well, John 1, 1 through 3, and other passages tell us that the creator of heaven and earth is the second member of the Trinity, God the Son. Amen. And so here Abraham meets the pre-incarnate Son of God who tells him, you, in your rescue, have provided a picture of what I will do for sinners if they will but come to me in faith and in repentance. So here, after sparing no expense in rescuing Lot and his family from the Babylonians, Abraham meets this one who's going to go to the cross and rescue him from his sin, none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of righteousness and peace, our prophet, our high priest, our king, the one who went to the cross to rescue us as well. Keep in mind, God still uses pictures. And some of those pictures are our involvement in rescuing the defenseless too. Because those acts all point to what Christ did for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Genesis, Lord. I, I hope that we have a new appreciation for this book. But that really we have a new appreciation for you and what you did for us. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son, the King of righteousness and the King of peace who gave up his life that we might have eternal life and peace with you forever. Thank you for his resurrection to prove that you accepted his sacrifice on our behalf. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's